Hey everybody, today we are going to be continuing our stream on painting curriculum. So Clara, why don't you kick us off? What have we talked about in the past? Well, first of all, I would like you to know that ArtProf is the site that you need if you can't afford an art class. We've got tutorials, critiques, art dares, and professional development. Now I will get us started by letting you know that this is actually part two that we're doing today of the painting curriculum for self-taught artists. So in part one, what we did was went over each of the different paint types. So you would know really what's available because some of these are actually quite obscure. And some of them, Lauren and I were like, what is this? <laughs> it's out there. And today we are gonna focus on painting prompts, knowing that you can do these prompts in any paint media that you want. Now, Alex, why is it nice to have a prompt to get started when you're studying painting? For me, prompts are so good because the threat and the looming nature of a blank canvas can sometimes be too much of, all right, I just got to paint today, either to learn a new medium or to fine tune a medium you're using. And some days it's just hard to think of a concept. So a prompt is a really good way to, I think, just focus on the craft, to turn off that creative mind for a second and just focus on the medium and the material. Tell us in the chat, who here is afraid of the white canvas? I am, for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, we're going to go over a few abstract prompts. However, I am doing a stream later this week that is just on abstract painting prompts, so we're going to expand further. But we're going to give you some really simple ones to get started. And I think learning how to make a broad range of marks is really helpful. And playing with tools and additives that are not brushes is really helpful. Why do you think this is a necessary part of learning to be a painter, Alex? It's a lot of what I was saying of why it's good to turn off that creative mind because yes, you need to think creatively when you do it, but a lot of it too is honing that skill of learning how the physical media you're working with works. And in this way, playing around with everything you got, if additives are what will really unlock new ways of thinking for you, give those a try. Because there are so many, especially with acrylic, that you can just add in to create texture and new looks. Also, who says you always have to paint with a brush? There are a lot of different things that you can do to get good textures with your pieces. And a lot of this stuff, I can explain to you all day what I think matte medium is, but you don't really know until it's in your brush and you're painting. And I don't know about you, Alex, but so much of the painting experience for me is the feel in my <laughs> brush. And I cannot figure that out without actually trying it. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes with even different colors, because sometimes because of the pigments, different colors feel differently or they're more transparent or more opaque than another color you're used to. And that's not always based on series one or series four or how expensive it is. You just need to practice with it. Now, I think a really good starting abstract painting prompt is to do a painting of a sky because a lot of the times I find when somebody gets a landscape prompt, it's almost too much because then you have to think sky, water, rocks, grass, and it's all these different things. Mm -hmm. And there are these beautiful paintings of skies by John Constable that really, I think, let you play within that area of the sky, but it doesn't lock you down into painting a rock and a pebble and a tree. Yeah. And I think you're so smart to call this like an abstract painting exercise. Because when I think of kind of my mindset I had in high school of like, nope, I must paint realistically. Abstract is not art. <laughs> like painting a sky would have been a great way to trick me into doing that of getting me to pay attention to the subtle color changes and the textures and really play around with that. Emma says, oh my God, Alex, if you drew the <laughs> long side of your hair out, you and Prof could match. I know, actually, I was thinking we, about shaving. It's funny, we, we joked about that right before the street started. I'm like, wait, we have the same haircut now. <laughs> <laughs> Never in a million years would I've ever thought that would have been the case. <laughs> hmm. But what I love about these sky paintings by Constable 
is that it gives you something concrete because I'm like you, Alex. I am not an inherently abstract painter and I like feeling like I'm painting something even mm. though there's a lot of room to mess around. I mean, isn't the mark so beautiful throughout all these paintings? Oh, it's stellar. And you know, we're getting a really good question from Lisa H who's asking, uh, how does impression differ from abstract in painting? Because earlier Lisa H was asking like, wait a minute, this seems like you're talking about impressionistic painting rather than abstract painting of clouds. Well, I think a lot of these categories are meant to clarify things, but the thing is things are not really ever that straightforward. And for me, there's a lot of crossover and it depends on how you go about doing it. Some people, it might really look like clouds when they're done. Other people, it might end up not really looking like a sky at all. But mm -hmm. you have to keep in mind that the whole purpose of a prompt is to get you started. And whatever direction you end up taking it is fantastic. We also do all have right. a lot of amazing uh, clouds on our Flickr account that you can look up, all taken by Prof Lou herself. And just some of white fluffy clouds and blue background are varying degrees of intensity in the sky. So really good for you to look up at, you know, you like me have had just a couple days of cloudy, boring weather. <laughs> well, the mountains in Utah and the sky tend to be very dramatic. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot <laughs> for you to look at. Kassam says, I like how the sky has so many different colors that change throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what's so nice about the sky is that there's infinite variations in the colors and the marks. Like you will never have a sky look the same. And that's why I think it's a really good prompt because there's flexibility, but it's also specific. Mm -hmm. If you wanna get in touch with your inner baker, <laughs> you guys can learn how to pipe acrylic paint as I demonstrated. <laughs> and this is just so fun. Have you ever done anything like this, Alex? Not yet, but I am just like, oh, that seems so satisfying. And yeah, because I love piping on baking and piping with acrylic. Funny enough, I think the texture would make it a lot easier. <laughs> so this is also another prompt, which is called texture or taste. So for this prompt, you think about a texture that you are excited about, or you think about a taste that you like. So tell us in the chat right now, if you were to do this prompt, would you pick texture or taste? And what would you pick? Because in Lauren's case, it was Japanese barbecue squid. <laughs> that was her so texture and her taste. I mean, she put them all in one. But I just love this as inspiration for her painting. Mm. And squid is just always fun to paint, just octopus and just, mm. I think it's funny. I remember when Lauren painted this painting and I think of it every single time I cook squid or octopus, every single time. <laughs> Well, if you guys watch this tutorial, you can see that Lauren does get very physical with her paint, adding things like coffee grounds and doing the piping. And that can be very exciting to do. I mean, you don't have to paint it like Lauren. I mean, there's a million ways to talk about texture or taste. But I like mm -hmm. this prompt because it's abstract in that you don't have to paint a squid, but that sensation of a taste doesn't have a specific image most of the time for a lot of people. Yeah. Even on a comedic note, Neil is saying that Neil would paint the taste of freedom. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you could even go full on like abstract in that of like, what would freedom taste like if you had to put a taste in it? <laughs> and so this is an example by one of our interns from a few years ago, and she actually mixed sesame seeds into mm -hmm. the paint on the bottom. And I think it's little spiky things on the cactus that she mixed in as well. And this one got really 3D. I think this is based on Korean fried chicken. <laughs> and she had like a lot of coffee grounds and made this like 3D wow. piece of chicken. Like I just love this <laughs> so much. I mean, it's almost moving into a sculptural prompt. That makes, I almost love the idea of painting a very trompe l'oeil photorealistic like 
napkin on a table and then just super gluing a fried chicken piece to it. <laughs> like that would be that would be very funny as far as a joke on texture. And it's mm. great to see the range because this is not all textured like the chicken was. This is very glossy. Mm -hmm. And I think if you think about the range that's out there, there's no end to what you can do. And then the other cool thing about this project is you can do many of you. Do, you don't have to just do one painting and call it a day. I mean, you could do five texture or taste paintings. So that's another way for you all to work with our prompts is don't just see it as one prompt. You can almost make variations on a theme. Or it reminds me of some some of my favorite assignments I had in school for the challenge of the one painting with multiple textures. I still remember some drawing assignments where it's like, all right, you have to have a figure wearing two different kinds of fabric. So say denim and fur, you have to have glass, you have to have velvet, you have to have porcelain, you have to have metal. And like, how do you depict all of those different textures? It can get really exciting really quick. So Alex, I would like to know, as Soitan Lee oh. is asking, can you paint the taste of Guinness drought stout? That would actually be such a fun painting. Like the way when you pour it in it has that kind of woobity woobity woobity, the technical term of it all woobity. That would be so much fun to paint. And yeah, I'm trying to think of, my first thought is I'd want to use like an additive or a mixture to get the texture of the foam in there, which is ironic because the foam is mostly air. Like your first instinct would be to make it light to, but yeah, no, that would be so much fun to take to paint. I mean, there's lots of great ideas that people are adding in the chat. So you can see that this prompt has a lot of potential in terms of where you want it to go. Mm -hmm. And just in case you can't find any textures around, <laughs> we've got you covered on our Flickr page. You want to paint a bathroom loofah, this eagle that I spotted at the <laughs> uh, aviary, or this fish that I bought from the market and then realized I didn't know how to clean a fish and made a horrible mess in my kitchen. <laughs> Did you put it in the dishwasher? I did not, but I probably <laughs> might as well have done that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about still life prompts. Now, Alex, I know a lot of people, they hear the word still life, they go, oh, that must be so boring. But yep. I really benefited from still lives because just the simplicity of it, it helped me get over a lot of the complexity of painting because painting is like, the brush, the palette knife, the mediums, the can, it, there just was so many tools that I liked the simplicity of still life. Was that the case for you or do you roll your eyes on still life? <laughs> no, I agree with your, In I'm, I'm much more in the camp that I roll my eyes at still life. I hate doing them. It's like going to the gym where I know I should, but I don't. Um, but you're right. It is such a good way to learn because it's not like painting outside where it's a whole ordeal and your lighting can change every half hour. You can set up the source and depending on if it's, um, if you're using like raw fruit or something, it won't fade away. It won't disperse. You can work as long or as short on it as you want. And it's exactly such a good way where it's like your subject is right there. You don't have to think about anything. Just learn the medium, get comfortable with it super stable. Nothing is going to change. And honestly, if you're a beginning painter and you don't have a lot of experience, you're going to have a million other things to think about. You don't want to worry about that when you're trying to learn all these skills. So this is a really fun technique. It's a monochromatic painting where basically you wipe away with a rag and then you add paint. And it's also nice because yeah, color is a whole other can of worms. And I just like the simplicity of, okay, still life, very straightforward monochrome i can just focus on value it's a lot more simple mm -hmm. and you're actually soy tanley saying uh still life isn't boring if you really look so many reflections and reflected light and i think that's actually a very good lesson to keep in the foreground of it's not like oh i don't want to paint a banana on a table but when you look at it it's a really an exploration of the texture of the light color if you so choose so yeah it is it is still an exciting process. Well, Kassam says, I want to do more creative setups. Maybe we can find mm. 
interesting objects at thrift stores or like Value Village or something. Exactly. Still life does not have to be an orange and peach with a bus. <laughs> it, it can totally be whatever you want it to be. And I think that's what makes it a lot more fun is people just don't take the responsibility to find objects that are fun. Like I'm never going to set up a still life. If I look at something and I'm bored, I'm not going to do it. I find something else that I enjoy painting. Yeah. There was, um, we had a professor who would raid thrift shops and steal <laughs> all of their steal is the wrong word. I meant it, uh, figuratively. He would buy all of like the beautiful cups and glassware and then come in for the still life class. And we'd unload his car with all of these interesting trinkets and knickknacks to make the still lives exciting and eager for us to paint. Yeah, Jazz W says, thrift stores are great to find inspiration for still life. I have some weird toys from the 1970s and some red cowboy boots all worked in. See, that's great. Mm -hmm. Come on, how can you not want to paint something like that? Like, that's so cool. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I just got to share one more comment from Mills Gwimper on still lives. Um, stuff on the nightstand and bookshelf. Because, yes, this makes me think the reason I have a hard time with still life is because there's no characters in them since I'm so narrative based. But I love the idea of a self portrait in what is on your nightstand. Now, the next step from the monochromatic still life is a complementary color still life so go and watch our streams on complementary colors where we explain in depth exactly what they are but basically what i ask students to do is to make a complementary color chart so you can understand what are the differences between the subtle shifts of gray that you create and we do have this stream that goes through step by step the entire process but then what i usually do is i follow it up with a complementary color still life so Alex, why do you think this is a good way to enter color with this limited scheme? It's, I mean, I think we all know that color is extremely intimidating to get into. And this helps you little, slow down a little bit and just focus on a color combination that you know will work. You could literally just squirt orange and blue onto a canvas, call it done. People are like, you know what? That looks pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because those colors, we know they work well together. Um, and so it'll help you not just, it'll help you relax with that and think of things like, which one do you want to emphasize? Which one do you want to focus on? I just think that I've seen a lot of people when they start painting, they feel this pressure that they have to do everything all at once. I got to mm -hmm. do that. I got to do color. I have to do bright. And I'm like, no, you don't. You can take away some of those factors so you can get to know things a lot better. And so that's what we're doing with the still life sequence is we're starting with something very simple. And then with every prompt, we tack on another element for you to explore because painting is overwhelming. Don't you think there's so much to think about? Yeah, and every single painting is overwhelming. There's no easy single painting. I, I think the last time I tried to set up a still life, I was like, <laughs> I'm an illustrator. I think I know what I'm doing. I'll set up a very complex still life. And it, it was a complete failure because I forgot to make it simple. I forgot to make it about learning. All right. And we do have these four streams where I do a purple and yellow still life from beginning to end using water mixable oils. And I do speak specifically about those relationships. And Jazz is saying, would you mix down the browns from the complementaries? Hmm. I don't know that I totally understand the question. Do you want to take a stab at that, Alex? I think so. So, yeah, by mixing the complementaries, that would actually form closer to a gray. Um, because it's interesting where brown is technically a yellow, which is kind of mind-blowing. But yeah, brown technically being a yellow, that would work well with the purples. And then mixing those in from the complementary colors, absolutely. All right, now the next variation on a complementary color still life, this is your thing, Alex, complementary mm -hmm. color underpainting. Can you explain first what is an underpainting and then why you're doing this wacko blue lobster thing? <laughs> the underpainting is, essentially sketching i like to think of it it's sketching with the paint it's blocking out your basic shapes and in this case your basic colors 
Um, but I've been doing this for years now, and it is such a good way to keep an eye on what your intended color is by the end of the painting, and also to allow the underpainting to provide an interesting assistance to the finished product. So when you leave the underpainting visible, nine times out of 10, it can have a nice look of texture or changing the light in some way in the painting. But in this way, when the complementary color is the underpainting, when you let it shine through, it instantly makes a really cool point of contrast within your subject. Yeah, I think that when you started doing this <laughs> for the acrylic to draw, I'm like, what are you doing? I don't <laughs> understand. But I think a lot of these exercises, what they're meant to do is to get you out of painting literal colors. Because oftentimes, if you're not thinking about it, you can look at a red apple and say, it's red. It's got the red paint. Yeah. But the thing is, it's never really red. There's always a lot more involved. And so I think when you have a complementary color underpainting, you have to find those colors. Like you can't just paint it red. Absolutely. All right. This is another step that gets you to think a little bit more deliberately about what the still life represents. Because actually throughout history, still lives have meant to be symbols of different concepts. And so one that was very popular was the Dutch Bonitas still life movement. And basically these still lives were intended for each object in the still life to have meaning. So basically the message here is you're going to die. They were really into mortality and the fragility of life. Right, Alex? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All of us too. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a good and, life. <laughs> and so these obviously are very dated looking in terms of the objects, but I'll say to students, listen, do a Dutch Vanitas still life, but use contemporary objects. And they typically had stuff like an unraveling piece of fruit, or they'd have fruit that was rotting or that had insects on it. Or very often there was a skull because duh represented mm -hmm. death. <laughs> and so there are all these certain symbols, but I think what's fun is to bring it into a contemporary landscape. Yeah, like I, this one, for example, it's all a bunch of like candy and sugar and cigarettes and things that are bad for you. Um, and it's such a cool, challenging way to think of it in a way of, like you said, with every step of the still life assignment, it's like getting more and more complex to let you think more and more about it. And yeah, it's such a funny prompt of, okay, make this still life tell a story. So we've gotten a couple comments, then myself included, where I like narrative paintings, so that's why it's hard for me to do still lives. But this is a way where you can tell a story through the still life. Matt says, I'm also thinking about how simpler still lives can inform growth, like someone such as Hope Gangloff's style may have evolved from these simpler practices. Oh, I think lots of painters start that way. I just think sometimes when you're learning on your own, it's really easy to get impatient and just want to like jump to the fun stuff. But mm -hmm. you're gaining really fundamental skills here that are going to help you long term. Do you ever get impatient with your development, Alex? All the time, um, especially when I'm trying out a new media that I know is going to be exciting. I just want to be like, all right, I just want to make like my best painting ever with this right now. And no, even if you've been painting for years, when you're trying something new or experimenting with something, it takes a little bit of practice. All right, I love this still life project. <laughs> it's self-portrait as a fruit or vegetable. And when I gave this project, Alex, to my painting from observation class at RISD, the funny thing is that the students told me that they all asked their friends, hey, if I were fruit or vegetable, what would I be? Like they didn't come up with it on their own. They really wanted everybody <laughs> to determine yeah. what they were. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us in the chat, if Alex and I, if we were a fruit or a vegetable, what would we be? We need to hear from the audience. Alex, you have to tell us what you think you would be and I'll tell what I think I would be. Yeah, um, I th if I had to choose, I would say banana. Um, We've got also a question about parsley. 
So one parsley. Of those parsley? I think yeah. Parsley. I think I'm more of a banana. What about you? I can see banana because it's like nice and soft and comfort food. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would be something very tart and intense. Maybe I would be a cranberry. <laughs> <laughs> Like very small in quantity, but intense. Well, Darian is saying tomato and banana. Neil is saying Professor Lou is a jalapeno. Alex is a pear. <laughs> <laughs> we got a second vote for pear. <laughs> oh, wait, Alex, Naples yellow bananas. That's See, okay, you're definitely good. banana with the Naples yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Ooh, Alex, I think I could live with being a pomegranate. That's oh, cool. yeah, because then that has that art history connotation as well. That's pretty good. And Greek mythology. I like that. Mm -hmm. All that symbolism, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, for this prompt, you can take it however you want. I mean, this student chose to paint something that was a little bit more traditional. I mean, it looks more like a red beet, but it definitely has a story here. Like, how well, do you feel that this is more of a portrait, Alex, than a still life of a beet? It's so, it's, it'll make, it'll sound very funny, but like I, whenever I make a veggie burger that's beet based, it looks more violent than when I'm making a meat patty. Like if I get steak and I grill it up, it doesn't look violent. Whereas I cut a beet and I mash the patties together. I'm like, this is a, it looks like a murder. And I think it's, I, I love this still life because it's not only well done, but it's also a little tongue in cheek funny because it does have that connotation of like a crime scene. So does everybody see how far we got from the monochrome still life prompts to here? This really does encompass many, many more concepts than that first prompt. And so that's why I think a progression of prompts is very, very helpful. All right, let's talk about portrait prompts. And by the way, there's a billion other prompts that we're not gonna get to today. And if you guys really like this stream, tell us, we can do another one that has more prompts. I'm a big fan of this self-portrait palette knife painting. Have you ever done this before, Alex? They are a blast. Um, using just a palette knife for a painting, if you haven't done it yet, please do. It really gets you to think about texture, really gets you to think about the surface and carving out the painting. And you don't have to worry about cleaning your brushes, which let's be real, is a pretty nice perk. <laughs> well, and also Alex, I find it relaxing to mm -hmm. just paint with a palette knife because oftentimes if I'm painting with a brush, there's this back and forth and you're cleaning it. Just having one palette knife to work with, again, simplifies the process and yeah. you get to know your palette knife. Like, like if you've been holding off on getting to know your palette knife, you, you are going to be bosom buddies by the time this is over. <laughs> now, here's a variation on the self-portrait palette knife painting is you can do one with natural light and one with artificial light. Why do you think that might be helpful, Alex, to do two different lighting situations? First, I want to give a shout out to uh, Anna Wider for giving the $2 super chat. Thank you so much. Your support really means a lot and helps us make more videos like this. I think the two lighting, it's important because it helps you notice, for me, not so much the light, but the shadow and what that does to it. And the lighting changing the whole color and mood of it. And all of it changes depending on how you portray it. Not just natural or artificial, but what kind of day, what kind of night, and what sort of artificial light are you using can change everything about the mood portrayed. And I also noticed, Alex, whenever I taught introductory painting classes, people really don't use their palette knife very much. If you give them brushes and you give them a palette knife, they'll use a palette knife like 5% of the time. And mm -hmm. then I do the self-portrait with palette knife project and then they really start to use their palette knife because it's almost like an underappreciated tool until you really have spent time with it because everybody assumes that painting is all about the brush, but really the brush is just another tool and the palette knife in my opinion, is drastically undervalued and this will get you to appreciate it as a tool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 
All right, let's talk about another portrait prompt, which is a mood portrait. Basically, think about a mood you want to establish in the portrait, whatever you want it to be. Because I do think I see, Alex, a lot of portraits where it's like, that's what I look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and that that's it. And this one, I think it, what's becoming a theme of this stream is talking about ways to get people that don't like the like nitty gritty homework of art because it's not story based. And this is a terrific way to be like, ah, no, it's not just a boring old self portrait to get you to learn how to paint better. It's a story. You can show part of mood or an expression or even make it narrative. And it gets, for me, that's a lot more exciting than just another portrait. I love Max Beckman's self portraits because mm -hmm. he puts on a different persona <laughs> for every painting. I mean, doesn't he look like he belongs in the Godfather movies it's here? It's so good. Like, I love it. <laughs> and I can totally, and, they look so serious and somber, but I can imagine him having a blast, like trying on these different faces and coats and such. <laughs> and that's really where I think portraiture can be very powerful, where you're not just painting what you see, you're actually thinking about. I'd really like to be in The Godfather. <laughs> Let's mm -hmm. see what that would look like. Yeah. <laughs> Jazz is asking, mm. which is the best palette knife to paint with? Let's see. I definitely would agree with Kasim first saying the plastic ones aren't as flexible. Where they're bendy, but honestly, the only palette knife I've had that broke was a plastic one, <laughs> which I think I was pushing it too hard. I'm surprised the canvas didn't break. Um, I think that involves experimentation because Clara, I think you have more experience about this than I do, but it's almost overwhelming if you realize you like painting with a palette knife and then you realize there's a whole section of the art supply store that's as many palette knife types as there are brushes. And to me, that kind of defeats the purpose of painting with a palette knife. What do you think about that? Well, I'll show you guys right now. <laughs> this is my favorite palette knife, okay? I have never used anything other than this one. I like the length of it. Like, there's a lot of palette knives that are very short. And when they're very short, they're just not very flexible. But this is my cup of tea. I mean, not everybody here is going to like this palette knife. This is just one that happens to work for me. So I would say, Jazz, just go to the art supply store and just play with the palette knives and just see how it feels when you're using it. Because I don't like the tiny ones. They just feel too rigid. I like the longer ones because they sort of bounce and bend a little bit. I like that flexibility, but it really, really depends on you as a person. I agree with Alex. I think the plastic ones are not good. I think that they're very prone to breaking and they just don't move as well, right? Yeah. You know, we're getting a good idea from Ariel here saying, Prof. Clara, paint yourself as Jane Eyre, which one is not just a good assignment for you, but I think is a good assignment for everyone. Like I, to this day, love having like my portfolio um, projects are painting pieces of well-known literature. I love it. And that's a really fun way for me to get into is like, oh no, don't paint a self-portrait, like dress as a character that you want to portray. I could also just paint myself as Hugh Jackman's wife. Like that's a little bit more direct. Okay, that would be so <laughs> funny and very sad. <laughs> like walk in and over your mantelpiece is a beautiful oil painting of you and Hugh Jackman on the wedding. <laughs> Matt says, I think the palette knife is a really personal tool. I love the metal mm -hmm. ones that are the elongated diamond shape. The one I use is my great grandmother's. Yes. It's metal has an excellent flexibility and control. Cool. That's really, actually, yeah, the palette knife that I've used uh, was my grandpa's palette knife. Because, yeah, his whole oil painting set and the palette knife is the one thing that's easily transferable to all mediums. Cool. All right, so we have a few prompts that deal with value. And I recommend watching this stream, which goes over the nuts and bolts of value. The first one is chiaroscuro portraits. Can you explain to everybody, Alex, what chiaroscuro is? Yeah, chiaroscuro is dramatic lighting is the quickest, shortest way to summarize it. And it was from an era where light was only able to be formed through candlelight or fire. 
So it helped to make this look where things were subdued by the darkness around them. And the source of light became a good source of narrative and symbolism, typically showing a sort of divine presence. Yeah, and there's a long tradition of many, many artists like Ribera, and also we're going to look at Caravaggio in a minute, George de la Torre. And this is a good exercise because it has color, but the focus of the painting really is about lighting because lighting is so important in terms of color. When were you really conscious of lighting, Alex? Because I never thought about that in high school. Yeah, definitely not in high school. It wasn't until I think halfway through art school um, when it was like came off as almost a joke, a professor said of like, yeah, like beginning painters paint this subject, advanced painters paint the light, and then expert painters paint the air. <laughs> kind of <laughs> like, yeah, like how to look at it and how to really look at what you're seeing. That was, I think, yeah. the first time. And you can see that lighting changes everything. We've talked about how movies have whole crews, their whole job is just the lighting. I mean, there's a reason why that is such an involved job. And I think if you look at these Caravaggio paintings, you can see that it's a very particular mood. It highlights the form in a very specific way. I mean, if you wanna paint yourself as a decapitated head, what else are you gonna use, right? Oh, that would be that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see you do that, Alex. I think actually, you that's a gr all of these are great because I so many of these are biblically inspired. That's such a good um, good realm for self portrait assignment of biblical or saint. Actually, Michelangelo would often paint himself as what's the name of the saint who was skinned? So it was just like the oh, skin. I can't remember. But yeah, Michelangelo painted himself as that saint all the time. I feel like that should be an art dare. Like, paint yourself as a fictional character. <laughs> yes. Oh, that would be <laughs> Like, I want to see you, Alex, as Mr. Darcy for Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> you would, would be, be such so a good Mr. Fun. Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> so tell oh, us in the chat, if you were to do a self-portrait as a fictional character, who would it be? I would like to know. <laughs> All right. The next one is a prompt from Lauren, which is to create a night painting. And this is so interesting because it's almost the opposite of chiaroscuro, which is dramatic lighting and very clear, articulate passages of light falling on form. This is all about being barely there. The mm -hmm. most subtle shifts. Why is this a good exercise, Alex? Most of all, I think it's about training your eye. Um, the end, like if you can get a great painting out of this, like more power to you. Some of these are really successful and so powerful. Um, but honestly, when I've done night painting portraits, be sitting, actually it would look similar to this, of course, much worse, where I'd be sitting on my porch and painting the across the street neighbor's house and you'd have only the light from the moon, street lamps, and their windows. And you just look at colors so much more intently when you're like, okay, everything looks dark blue. What color is it really? Well, because if you have a scene with chiaroscuro lighting, it's really easy to just focus on the highlighted sections and just go, oh, that's black, I'll just fill it in. But I think you can see from all these paintings there's a lot you can do, even in a very limited value range to create depth. And this painting prompt really gets you to do that. Because most of us would not. Most of us would say, oh, no, 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 I'm going to focus on this other stuff. But this is actually pretty important. Jazz W says, do you paint it in the dark? You can. It's tricky <laughs> with the lack of light. I mean, I think Lauren said you can get like a book light, like one of those tiny little things yeah. just to highlight what you're looking at, but it, there's no rule for how to do this. I think the whole purpose of it is just to work with a very limited value range. Yeah, I think painting in the dark, um, that's what I did. And yeah, likewise, I used a book light. What's tough is then all the training your eye does to see the dark in front of you goes out the window when you go back to look at the painting with a bright light. 
So one trick I found, which also works if you have to get up a glass of water in the middle of the night, is cover one eye and then use that one to look. And it's a little weird, but that does work. But otherwise, if you're good at photography, I'd say snap some photos and paint them in the comfort of the daytime. <laughs> All right. The next prompt is, again, polar opposite, white on white. What you do for this project is you pick only white objects, you have a white backdrop, and you assemble them together. What is this going to get you to do, Alex, as a painter? <laughs> yeah, and if you want to do this on hard mode, you don't use white paint. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, yes. what is You're doing? evil. You think, you think of what the color actually is. Um, actually very similar in concept to the night painting of oh everything looks dark blue mm, but that's not true what color is it really and you start to question what that is and it's about yeah again this might not turn out to be a good painting but your eyes will be like super strong after this and really that's what all these prompts are they're not really intended to make oh amazing paintings they're, they're learning tools they're experiences that you're gathering as a painter, and then you will apply those experiences when you really are trying to make a finished piece. So I would never look at these prompts as a means to like produce amazing artwork. In fact, that can be very paralyzing if you go into it with that mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I have to tell myself that before, not just every practice painting, but every painting painting I do, like this doesn't have to be your best thing. This isn't your best masterwork. This is just a painting you're working on. Another thing that I really like about this white painting exercise is it really gets you to compare colors. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes if you're doing a still life and you have a red apple next to a green apple, it's so duh, you're going to paint one red, you're going to paint one green. But here you have two whites. You have to say, well, which one's just a little more pink? This one's a little bit more blue. And you may not bother to see those subtleties if the objects in your still life are so blatantly one color. Mm -hmm. And it just gets you to think about them. Like right now on my desk, I have a sheet of blank white Bristol board. And before thinking about it, it's like, oh, it's just white. But now I'm seeing how warm it actually is in comparison to like the cool white of this shirt. Ariel says, I think prompts make me more creative. I was actually talking to somebody about that the other day, how sometimes when I was teaching at RISD, Alex, students would complain about prompts. Oh, that prompt is stifling my creativity and I don't feel that I can express myself. So you hear a lot about that. But actually, I had people in the Discord say to me, you know what, the art dare this month, which is to make abstract paintings, the limitations that you set, they're making it easier for me to be creative as opposed to do whatever. Why, why do you think prompts are helpful in that way? You would not think that's the case. Yeah. And in fact, we began this by saying, don't worry, you have a prompt. You don't have to think creatively. You can just exercise. But that's almost the cool thing of that's our brain. That's our creative minds being like, no, 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 no. We, we got to think creatively about this. <laughs> like you're given limitations, which essentially your brain is saying, okay, how do I make this fun though? How do I make it so that I enjoy it? Yeah. And I actually, usually at the end of the semester for RISD class, I would make the final project really, really broad. And I have students who are like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I've lost help. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, now you guys want all the prompts. So it's interesting <laughs> how sometimes the prompts stimulate more creativity than when you're just told do whatever. So. Oh, absolutely. Helps. By the way, this Google slideshow is available. The link is in the YouTube video description below. It's also on artprof.org on the art resources page. All of our slideshows are there. And yes, we will be working on a Google doc to accompany the painting curriculum. I just haven't had time to get to it yet, but I will. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Alex and I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord. Please join us in the post live streams channel so we can talk about dragon fruit and peaches and pears <laughs> because this seems to be the fruit stream, I suppose. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel so you can continue to grow and develop as an artist. 
And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters for your contributions that allow us to keep ArtProf up and running and available and free without a paywall to everybody who wants art education. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.